Sechiz Imam Estaf Pei Veis continues the Gemara's discussion of the Machlokas of Yechon and Rishlokish, as Psad in the Mishnah. We've had one Machlokas as to how to learn the Mishnah, which spiraled into four different Machloks in between Yechon and Rishlokish and a number of different Sugyas. The Gemara is going to be working through them in reverse order. So the Machlokas began with what is the Allah of an androgynous, that is somebody who has both male and female signs. The Mishnah had seemed to indicate that it counts as a male. The question is, is that a vaday male or is that a suffix male? Rav Yechanan said it's a vaday, even Lakula, and Rish Lakish said it's a suffix. Based on that, we got into a discussion of truma bizman hazeh. According to Rav Yechanan, that's a deraisa. According to Rish Lakish, that's a derabanon. That took us into a Mishnah which we were trying to figure out about a uh, chaticha. What do we hold about a chaticha, which is a devar chashuv? Is that bottle or not bottle? Rav Yechon said it is bottle. Rav Yechon said it's not bottle. And that took us into a price which we were trying to explain, which discussed a piece of carbon meat or a lachem aponim that got mixed into other things. What is the halacha over there? And how do you understand the two parts of the Mishnah, of the b'risa? Uh, according to Rav Yechlan, we're discussing a regular piece of meat or bread, and according to Rish Lakish, we're talking about where it's ground up or dissolved. So the Gemara is going to be analyzing that b'risa and that machlokis more specifically, and then we'll broaden our conversation to the other machlokis in which we've been discussing. So we have this b'risa, and it says two cases. The first case is if you have carbon meat or lechem apanim, both are kajim, that are mixed into tomei meat or bread. There... If you rule that it's that the tame that's in the mixer and it's a minority, if you rule that the tame ones are butel in the majority, then you would be allowed to eat it. Kohanim would be allowed to eat it. They're the only ones who are allowed to eat it anyway. Uh, other than that, there's no option. Now, the Mishnah's ruling over there is that it's not butel according to Rabbi Yehuda. According to the the Tanakama, it is bato, but even the Tanakama agrees that if you had this meat or bread that was mixed into tahar meat or bread, the difference being that the carbon meat and the chalpana meat only kahanim can eat, but the regular tahar meat and bread, which is chulin, even Yisraelim can eat. So the question is, who could eat the mixture? Only kahanim or even Yisraelim. There, the chachamim, the Tanakama agree that it's not a bottle. The Gemara's question over there was, what is the difference between the first case and the second case? According to Rabbi Yochanan, these things are not considered to be a Dover Chashev, so it makes sense that it's bottle, at least in the first case. The Gemara also says it makes sense that I understand why if it's mixed into Tahar, if it's mixed into Chulin, we say that it's not bottle according to the Chachamim, and that's because since it's only a little bit of loss. You're not going to lose the meat completely. Kohanim can still eat it. The only thing you're going to lose is that you have to have it eaten only by Kohanim. You can't give it to Yisraelim to eat because it has a little bit of kachim mixed in. So you're going to lose some value. So because of that small loss, we're not going to say it's bottle. We won't rely on bitl just because of that loss, especially since we're talking about a davar chashav, where even though Rav Yechon doesn't hold that the davar chashav is not bottle, but if this small nafkamino, we will hold that the davar chashav is not bottle. So I understand the difference between the first case where it's mixed into tame and it's a question of losing everything, versus where it's mixed into tar and a question of losing a little bit. It's mixed into tar chulin and it's a question of losing a little bit. It's a davar chashav. And therefore, we're going to say that it's not bottle. The question is according to Reish Lakish. First of all, according to Reish Lakish, this meat is a davar chashav, it shouldn't be bottle at all. So the Gemara says we're talking about where it's ground up. It's dissolved or it's ground up. So the Gemara's question right away is that if the only case in which it's bottle is when it's ground, why do you have to go to a case of when it's mixed into chulin to say that it's not bottle? Say that it's not bottle in a case where it's not ground. Versus we didn't want to talk about that. We wanted to talk about only cases of taharis, only cases of tahar and tahar. And we wanted to bring that case because there's an extra chiddish in the fact that truma tahira is batel um, in tamea because when there is when uh, you have the two things that are tahar is more likely to be batel uh, truma and chulin 
everybody agrees there's Tanoim, everybody agrees that they have Bittal, but Truma and Tome, that's a Machlokes, whether or not there's Bittal there. We wanted to bring out that we're going to the opinion that there is Bittal there. So that's why we didn't want to talk only about two cases of uh, Tahar, where it's ground and it's not ground. We want to talk about Tame specifically so we can show that there is Bittal there. But the question that still remains is why is the ratio different than the Seifa? Why is it different if it's mixed into, if you have Tame mixed into Tahar meat and it's all Kajim, or if you have Kajim mixed into Chulin? Either way, it's ground up, and the halacha is that ground up is, should be in this bottle. There's nothing there that's chasev. So it should be completely a double bottle. So what's the issue? So the Gemara wants to take three approaches to explain why there is a difference in these two cases, according to the uh, Tanakama. The Gemara's first approach is Rav Shisha Breder of Edi, and he says that the first case where we talked about where it's Tomei, it's Tumas Mashkin, which is Dirabanon. That is, you had Tomei liquids which touched the Kli, the rice that's not Matameit, only Dirabanon are liquids make everything Yashani, so it's Matameit. And therefore, uh, the Tumma in the beginning is only Dirabanon, the whole mixture is only in Iser Dirabanon. And in Iser Dirabanon, we rely on Bittal. Uh, the second case is talking about where you have Kachim mixed into Chulin, and the question is, can Yisrael eat it? That's an issue of a Dairaisa, and therefore we would not rely on Bittal in a case of Dairaisa. Says the Gemara, if that's true, so the only reason why there's a difference between the two cases is whether we're talking about Dairaisa or Dairabanon. So why do you have to talk to me about a case of where it's mixed into Chulin? Tell me two types of Tuma. You have Tuma Dai Raisa, it's not bottle. You have Tuma Dai it is bottle. Why do you have to change the case so much? And my answer is again, we want to talk about Tahara, so we want to compare Tuma and Tara. We want to show that there's Bittal in both of them because it's more likely to have Bittal in the case of Tara than it is in the case of Tuma. The answer we said before. Okay, now the Gemara goes to its second explanation of what's the difference between the Raisha and the Seva. This is Rabba. Rabba says the Raisha is only an Easter Lav. Worst comes to worst, you'll eat something. Uh, Tome is a lav. However, the seifa is talking about a non kohen eating kachim, that's kares. And therefore, we're much stricter with that and we say there's no bittal beer. So the Gemara asks the kashan, the Gemara says, Rav holds, uh, Rabbo, that is, this is Rabbo's answer. Rabbo holds there's no iser, there's no chilik between kares and lav as far as the halachos of bittal are concerned. We give them the same rules. So that's a kasha. Rabbo here seems to be uh, contradicting that, so it's a bit of a problem. Now, the Gemara's third approach is Ravashi, and Ravashi says that in the latter case, the Seifa is a Davashi Yeshla Matirin. It's permitted to somebody. It's permitted to the Kohanim, and the rule is you don't rely on Bittal whenever anything's Mutter, whenever it's a Davashi Yeshla Matirin. The Reisha is also to everybody, if you have Tuma, you have, each piece you have to be concerned that it's Tome, this Davar is not a Davashi Yeshla Matirin, there's no Heter to that, and therefore you do rely on a Bittal. So the Gemara says this is a mistake, this is a wrong answer, this is really not a Davashi Yeshla Matirin. Davashi Yeshla Matirin means the per- it's Usr to someone, and it's going to become Mutter. It doesn't mean that it's Usr to some people and Mutter to other people. It means the people that it's Usr to now can become Mutter. So wait for it to become Mutter instead of relying on Bittal. But here you don't have anybody that it becomes Mutter to. To Kahanim it was always Mutter. To Yisraelim it was always Usr. Okay. Now, this concludes the Gemara's discussion of this Brisa. Now the Gemara wants to go back to the Machlokas about Shuvim B'zman Hazeh. We'd seen as part of our earlier understanding of the Machlokas of Yochanan and Reish Lakish that Rav Yochanan holds that Shuvim B'zman Hazeh is a Deiraisa. So Gemara says, Avekash on that. There's a Brisa that says the following case. You have two containers of chun, and in front of them are two bowls. Each one um, has wheat in it. So you have two containers, two large crates. One is truma and one is chulin. In front of them you have two small bowls. One is truma and one is chulin. And the bowls fall into the crates. And I don't know which one fell into which. So if the truma fell into the chulin, it would asser it. It would potentially asser it. Unless you have a sheer bittal there. But it would potentially asser it. So the b'raisa says the halach is, is that you could assume that everything's mutter. The truma fell into the truma and the chulin fell into the chulin. Now there are two 
or three potential svaras to be matir. Svar number one is what we call talinon, that we assume that the truma, that each one fell into the place that's not going to make an ifsa. The truma fell into the truma and the chulin fell into the chulin. That concept of talinon is something we say on a darabonon question, we don't say on a daraisa. Also, you have a question of bitl here. Could possibly be batel if you have a sheer bittel that's involved. Now, it's possible that you could go lakula in certain circumstances even without the sheer bittel, as we shall see later on. Now, Rav Yachad and Rish Lakish dispute what is the case of this brisa. The brisa says that it's mutter. What is the case? Are we talking about where you had rove? of the chulin against the truma, that is the chulin which was in the crate containing chulin, was that more than the truma? If you had rove, so then even on the side that the truma fell into the chulin, at least you had rove to be mevatalit. Now rove is not usually something you rely on for bitol, but it helps, together with talinon, we could matter it. Now, Rish Lakish says we're talking about a case where you had rove. Rav is talking about a case where there's no rove. It was 50-50. So, now, Rish Lakish holds the Truma Bismana as a Durabanon, in which case we could theoretically rely on a Talina in itself. Talina works on a Durabanon. But it makes sense that Rish Lakish said, no, I want you to be more Machmer, and I want you to only matter it if you had a rove to add to it as well. So that even if the Truma fell into the Chulun, it was still a minority. Now, so that doesn't bother me. However, Kuntra Vyachlan, why does he say that this case is where there's no rove? If there's no rove, what are you relying on? That means the only thing you're relying on is Talina, the assumption that the Truma fell into the Truma and the Chulun fell into the Chulun. But you don't say that on a Daraisa. And Rav Yechanan, we said, holds the Truma as well as a Daraisa. So what's he doing here? How, why is he making it without rope? So the Gemara answers that Rav Yechanan says, it's a Machlokist Hanoim where the Truma as well as a Daraisa or a Darabanan. Up to now, I was talking in the opinion of Rabbi Yaisi, who was the author of the comment in our mission that this whole discussion started on, and he holds that it is Daraisa, as I'll show you in a different Brisa. This Brisa here is the Rabbanon, obviously, it doesn't quote of Yaisi, and the Rabbanon always hold the Truma as well as a Darabanan, and that's why I said they could rely on Talinan alone, they don't need Bittal. Now, what's the Brisa where we see that Rav Yechanan holds that Rav Yaisi? Holds that Truma as well as a Daraisa? So it's a Brisa in Seder Oilam. And Seder Oilam brings a Pusik, it says, Asher Yerushu Avesech of Yerush, that uses the word Yerusha twice, Benegay Tarat Yisrael, to show that there were two inheritances and two sanctifications of Eret Yisrael. First one, when Kal Yisrael came the first time from Mitzrayim, they sanctified it. There was a second sanctification when they came from Vavel afterwards, which shows that the first one had expired when they left. First Kedusha didn't last. The second Kedusha, however, is the last Kedusha. There is no other Yerusha. There's not going to be another Yerusha in the times of Mashiach. So therefore, the second Kedusha lasts and still continues until today. Second Kedusha continues until today. That means that the Truma is Daraisa Bizman And Rav Yechanan holds that Rav Yaisi is the author of Seder Oilam. We have, we, we have a statement of Rav Yechanan who says that Rav Yaisi wrote Seder Oilam. So therefore, we know that Rav Yechanan's opinion is that Rav Yaisi holds that Shuvah Mabazad is as Daraisa, and that's why he says it in our Mishnah. However, this price you're bringing, there it's their bottom. So, now they want to ask a question, because this answer only works if Rav Yoichanan holds that in the midst of their bottom, you don't need Rav. 50 50 is enough. The problem is that that's not true, and I'll show you in a Mishnah where the Rav Bonan hold you do need Rav, according to Rav Yoichanan. The Mishnah is talking about a mikvah. A mikvah has to have 40 saw of rainwater in it. If you have a mikvah with exactly 40 saw, and you pour in another cup of water, you pour in another saw of water, and then you scoop out a saw of water. Now, you didn't, most likely you didn't scoop out the saw that you poured in. So you don't have 40 saw of rainwater anymore. Now, the halacha is, it's still considered to be a kosher mikvah, because the saw that you poured in gets the din of mikvah water, and therefore the saw that you pulled out, even if it's not the water you pulled in, that's fine, even if you pulled out rainwater, the, and now it's still full with 40 saw of mikvah water exactly. Now, you can keep doing this until you pour out a certain amount of saw. What's that amount? So the lushan of this price is, of this Mishnah is until rove. So uh, Rav Yochanan comments on it and says, until rove. It's not the Mishnah, it's, it's Rav Yochanan says until rove. Now that seems to indicate you can go up till 19 sa. You could take out until you took out a minority, but you have to leave a majority of rainwater in there. And if that's the case, so then even in this mikvah here, um, you still need to have rove mikvah water. So well, how can you tell me that Rav Yechanan holds you don't need rove? You see here, he holds that you have to have rove. 
So the Gemara says, no, no, no. When we say until rov, we don't mean until you have rov left. We mean you could take out up till rov. You could take out twenty, but you can't take out more than rov. But you can take out up till fifty fifty. There's got to be. It's not that you have to have a majority left. It's up till a majority that you can take out. Um, so what you can do is, is you can make it fifty fifty. More than fifty. 50 isn't good because then you have a row of not mikvah water. But up to 50 50 is okay, and that fits with the real in his opinion here that he holds 50 50 is not a problem on Isure Diraban. All right, now the Gemara is going to focus on the basic Machlokas of Yochan and Rishlokish about what is the Lach of an Andragonist. So it's seen in a Mishnah that an Andragonist can marry a woman, but if a man marries him, it doesn't count. So this language, is talking Deraisa, is this talking Lachatchilo? So the Gemara asks, it says, an androgynous can marry a woman. That seems like L'Chadchil is allowed to go do that, which indicates that he's a Zohar Vadai. He's definitely a male. That supports Rav Yechanan's opinion, not Rish Lakish. So the Gemara says, Rish Lakish will defend himself and say, it doesn't mean that he should, he's allowed to go marry. It means that if he did marry, we have to assume that the marriage counts and she needs a get. We are machmer that he might be a male, but we don't say that he's for sure a male. He says, you can't say that. The Mishnah says he can marry. That's saying that the Chathchi is allowed to go do that. The says, no. If you look carefully in the wording, the next phrase says that if a Zohar marries him, it doesn't count. That means that that's talking to Yevet, right? That's talking about if, if, if it happened. That if a Zohar marries him, it doesn't count. Just like that's a Bidyevet, uh, the first case is also Bidyevet, even though the language doesn't sound that way. And therefore, it's all a Bidyevet. But Nechatechila um, wouldn't be allowed to because it's only a suffix. So the Gemara says, uh, first of all, not that way. It could be that the second case is Dievet because it's talking about the other Isser, talking about where a man marries him. And the first case is Lechatechila, it's saying that Lechatechila, he's allowed to go marry a woman because he's a Zachar Vadai. Either, either way, it fits if he's a Zachar Vadai. So it fits with Rav Yechanan's Lashon. But then the Gemara says we have a problem with Rav Yechanan, and that's if you look later in the Brisa, we have the opinion quoted of Rabbi Yaisi, of Rabbi Eliezer, who says that an androgynous is a Zohar Vadai. And he says that if another Zohar does Bi'ya with this androgynous, they get Skila. Skila you're only going to give if he's Vadai over Nisar. If there's a Tzad that this is a Nekeva or something else, then you wouldn't give Skila to the Zohar. So it's got to be that he's saying that it's a vadai. If Rabbi Yehuda is saying it's a vadai, and our Tana, the first Tana here, who's Rabbi Yaisi, is saying that something different than that, so obviously the Machalkis is over whether it's a vadai or it's a suffix. So that sounds like our Tana, who Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi are arguing about, holds it it's a suffix. Not like Rabbi Yehuda who said it's a vadai. So Mr. says, no. Aratana also holds it it's a vadai. They both hold it's a vadai zachar. The machlokes is over something else. If you look carefully in the wording of Rabbi Eliezer, he says, you give skila kiz zachar. Give skila like a zachar. The argument is, what type of bia? Is the bia of a zachar to a zachar? That's what he gets skila for? Of the bia of a zachar to a nekeva. Remember, this person has both nekeva and zachar organs. So he theoretically could have two types of bia from a zachar. The one that a zachar would do to another zachar, or the one that a zachar would do to a nekeva. So the the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer is that it's only if it's kizachar. That's where you have skila. The opinion of Tanakama is that any type of bia would chayev him skila.